they're going to be happy to talk to you because that's New Orleans. This is Happy Hour, a cocktail fueled 60 minutes of random conversation with folks who have nothing in common other than we're all New Orleans in a bar today. We're at the fabulous Wayfair on Ferret Street, which is home of not your mama's Frosé. The Frosé is a perfect <laughs> summer drink, a frozen cocktail made with... German. It's German originally. Yeah. How is it supposed to be pronounced? Velchance. Velchance. Yeah. Okay, Michelle, and how do we pronounce it now? <laughs> Velchance. Velchance, yeah, just nice. Velchance. And smooth. Where are you from originally? I'm from North Carolina, from Charlotte. Charlotte. Mm -hmm. Well, Charlotte. <laughs> well, Charlotte. But how are you liking your frosé? It's Pretty delicious. awesome, isn't it? Yeah, it's okay. kind of giving me a brain freeze. Already? <laughs> yeah. Well, this is a perfect show for it. I should slow down on it. And Michelle is here with Olivia Lee, which is also spelt weird. Not Lee. <laughs> Lee is spelt the traditional <laughs> way. It's good. L-E-E. L-E-E, -E. -E, yes. Which I thought you were going to be Chinese, but you're not at all. No, 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 it's not. It's you're from Uruguay. I'm from Uruguay, yeah. Are there a lot of uh, Lees in Uruguay? There are a couple, probably. More than me, yeah. Is that a Uruguayan name, Lee? It seems like a Chinese name. Well, no, I don't. I don't think it's Chinese. No. No Chinese no. in your family whatsoever. No, no. So where do people from Uruguay come from originally? Uh, well, we have a lot of immigration from Italy and Spain. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's no native people in my country anymore. There's no to. Uruguayans left in Uruguay. No, no. We are all from Uruguay. I mean, we are all from Uruguay. <laughs> now, how many people <laughs> live in Uruguay other than you? We have like three millions. Only three million people in the yeah. whole country. Yeah. Wow. That's not that many. No, it's not like, that many. I'm from Montevideo. It, Montevideo is the capital. And that's how half of the capital. How do you pronounce that again? Montevideo. Wow. Can you say that? Melissa Sawyer is here as well. Can you say... No, I'll botch it, but I'll try Montevideo. Is how Montevideo. I was that's Canada. perfect. Not Sounds great. Perfect. That's not how you were saying it. You said Montevideo. Well, I can understand that way. Also. Okay. <laughs> so, so the V in Montevideo is pronounced B, though. V is like more like... Video, B, B, B. Video. 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 It's oh, like video. Yeah. Well, that's great. So it's kind of or like Portuguese. Is it related to Portuguese? It's different. It's, it's different. not related at all. It's different. I mean, we have many uh, words in common, but it sounds super, super different. Yeah. It sounds different. Well, yeah. Portuguese sounds very different from Spanish. But Uruguay. Uh, from Spanish. I, I'm saying from Spanish, yeah. But Uruguay, you speak, what is it just straight Spanish? It's Spanish, it's, yeah. With it, some sort of dialect that sounds kind of. Video. Video. Why are you asking <laughs> Okay, just check it. And you guys no, are. But it's, yeah, it's Montevideo. Montevideo, okay. Video. <laughs> Can you say that, Melissa? I thought I already did. I, I, I wasn't sure. <laughs> and I thought I got a pretty good <laughs> I thought you were pretty good, too. So I think I've Do you done speak my any part. foreign I think languages? Adam should try. Adam Newman is here from Adam Newman Designs. <laughs> Can you say Montevideo the correct way? Montevideo, Montevideo. yeah, that's great. <laughs> Montevideo? Yeah, that was pretty you good. Can. Do you speak Spanish, Adam? Oh, lo siento, mi español es patético. Patético. Oh, okay. Pretty good, though. <laughs> Good. It's Very terrible, good. but I'm from but I'm from Texas. You're from Texas, so there's a lot of so Spanish it, speaking it in just Texas. Comes, yeah. Yeah. How terrible. long have you been here? A long time. Thirty-five years. Oh wow. Do you still say you're from Texas? Only if pressed. Right. And how long have you, Michelle? You came from? No, I took a, a long detour between Charlotte and here, but I've been here for four years. For four years. Yeah. And Olivia, how long have you been here? One year. Just one year. Yep. From Uruguay. No, I've been traveling. No, I left my country like six years ago. Right. Yeah. You the last place I, I, I used to live in Brazil before I came here. Yeah. Where were you in Brazil? In Rio, de Janeiro. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we brought um, a group of young people and then staff. We went to Brazil twice in the last two years. So we spent, I'm going to mess up the names again, but in Minas Gerais. Minas Gerais. Yeah. In uh, Belo Horizonte, we brought a group of young people and then we went to Rio after, which was so beautiful. And then we were in Sao Paulo for a week too this past uh, year. It was beautiful. Like it. Yeah, yeah. No, it was beautiful. Yeah. But Portuguese yeah. was really difficult. We took yeah, some lessons, but it was hard it for is. us to learn. It is also for me. I mean, the, the, the accent is so close. You know, if you don't speak the right way, they, they want to hear, they don't understand anything. So you got to be very, very, very... But lucky. Google Translate has been amazing. We've met amazing friends, and we can do so much now just with Google Translate. It's and amazing what technology can do. Yeah, really well, actually. Really? 
a lot better than yeah. me trying to. Yeah. <laughs> How many kids did you take with you to? We had a Brazil. group from Yep of 19 people total, so young people, staff. So this is your organization is called Yep, which is Youth Empowerment, Empowerment Project. Project. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us in one sentence or two exactly what that does? Yep works with about 1,200 underserved young people from across New Orleans, providing an array of mentoring, enrichment, education, and employment readiness services. Can you say that in Spanish, please? Que trabaja con 1,200 jóvenes de la ciudad de Nueva Orleans, preparándolos con capacitación profesional y servicios de enriquecimiento de no sé qué. I didn't really remember everything Pretty she impressive, said. but you, you, that was good. extremely impressive because you, you're a translator, right? Yeah. That's what you that do for, for a living. Yes. You also actually listen to people. That's really She was looking for right skill. <laughs> Can you translate Portuguese as well? No. Oh, because we're looking for a really good Portuguese translator. Just How much does it pay? Well, it depends yeah, on how Portuguese good you are. It depends quick. on experience. Do you speak Portuguese? No, oh. not yet, but... You might learn when do, if the, when if do the I dollar start? bounce right. Can you can you speak Portuguese though, right, I can, Olivia? I yeah. Can. Yeah, but I left. I mean, yeah, I can. I'm actually playing with the Brazilian guys right now in a band, and it's very very difficult for me. I realize I forgot a lot. Really? Portuguese, yeah. But, but if you I were can, getting paid to translate it. for, I can do it. I mean, come probably I can, it takes me a little bit longer than a Brazilian, or maybe, right. but okay. I can but probably do it. How much you How much you paying? I don't know. We're, you're you not going to put me on the spot. We're going to have to talk about this hour? afterwards. We're going to negotiate. How do they figure that out? Grant's, we're gonna Grant's <laughs> out of here. I, I, He's yeah. ready. I can certainly learn enough in an hour. But what are you doing it for, though? For who? For the kids? Well, actually, we brought back some, a pretty interesting biocentric methodology that's around social emotional learning. So there's a lot of dance and music and breathing and building empathy and community. And so as we're bringing that back to New Orleans from Brazil, we're also looking at bringing some. Actually, we might have another trip coming up. And so we might need a translator to go down with our team. But oh, then wow, also, awesome. if the team from Brazil comes back up just to help with the translation, is they're helping to teach us the methodology and provide support and technical assistance. Oh, wow, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah I'd love to keep talking. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. And this is totally legal to take a bunch of kids. Oh my God! Brazil? Yes. Great. No worries. What are you? What are you actually? What are you actually doing? <laughs> like now? Yeah. Then, I mean, what do you do with a bunch of kids in Brazil? I mean, it's, is it a boondoggle or is it really? No, it was. Well, it was wonderful. I got a little nervous, especially because there had turned out to be a yellow fever outbreak right in there. We were going right before we went. Um, and you need to have the yellow fever vaccination for right. 10 days prior to being good. And the CDC was rationing the vaccination. So there are only two places in Louisiana that had it. And so anyways, it was stressful towards the end, but we all got vaccinated. Hang and on, wait up for one sec. What are the two places in Louisiana where you can get a yellow fever vaccination? The one we went to was in Metairie. Um, I believe it was Thank called goodness, something not. like Passport Health. Um, and we all got our shots. And it was one of the most amazing transformational experiences for our staff and young people. A lot of people didn't have a passport before, hadn't been on a plane. Um, and so just to give people that learning experience was really powerful. It was, it was a really special experience. Yeah, that is cool. Yeah. That is very cool. The other place is on Airline Highway. I can show you. Oh, you've been there as well. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I think you're right though, actually. What exactly is oh. yellow fever? Do you know, Adam, have you ever had that? No. Because you're an artist, aren't you? A graphic artist? I, I am. Why is it called yellow fever then? Um, I don't know. Does it give you a power? Jaundice? Uh, jaundice? Like kind I of guess, a, is it? Uh, couldn't tell you. The pictures were terrifying. And I decided that in good faith I could not bring a large group of people on my watch and not make sure that we were well protected. But they always show yeah. you the, like, the freakiest, scariest pictures in like, public health magazines and like, well, right. books. But it was pretty harrowing and terrifying. Well, that's what the internet's for, so to freak you out. That's the <laughs> it, whole purpose. It worked. That's pretty interesting. So, what, so you're in charge of the... How many kids were there? Well, so we brought a group of 19 total, and we wanted wow. to bring a range of young people and staff and leadership to try to experience the methodology that they were doing in Brazil to make sure that it resonated and well, translated. What, what are they doing in Brazil that we don't know about in the terms of... Well, so they actually use it as um, a soft skill development curriculum, recognizing that a lot of young people, even though in the States we do more traditional job placement and training, but a lot of young people need to have a relationship with themselves and understand the challenges they've been through, and just like all adults do too, and then working on your relationship with the other, and then relationship on the job, and then relationship with the environment. So it's a lot of empathy building and self-awareness and then team building. But I think for us it's really built a sense of community and trust with a lot of circle work and, again, songs dance, there's a lot more touching and just communication, but it's created a really special safe space. It's something we're really excited about continuing. Is this where ayahuasca comes from? I'm sorry, I don't I don't know what that means. Ayahuasca. I don't know what is that. You don't know what that is, the drug? 
Oh my God, no, I don't know. Oh, you don't do drugs with these no, kids? I don't know. I don't do drugs at all. Sorry. Have you ever done any drugs? No, I'm not no. really. It's Have not you my guys thing. ever heard of the ayahuasca <laughs> experience? Yes. Ayahuasca. Yeah. Yeah. How do you say that in a. Spanish? No, I did. Ayahuasca. Well, what that's is it? different again. Ayahuasca, but it's the same that you're saying, right? Yeah. It's an no. Amazonian. It's a plant. Yeah, yeah. Plant. It's a plant. Yeah. It's a vine. Have no, you done it, Michelle? Yeah. You did it? Yep. Okay, so what did you think? Can what you explain to Melissa what it is? <laughs> um, it's a vine. It's called the vine of the dead. And uh, it's a really powerful medicinal plant used by indigenous peoples in South America um, to give you... It, it's kind of like one of the master keys, I guess, to the universe. It can give you a lot of information about life. And um, I believe the plant... There's some, there's some kind of relationship with the plant either how, I don't know if it's the visions it gives you or the actual makeup of the plant, it's like the double helix. Um, yeah, it's very deep. So you have to take this plant and mix it with another plant in order for it to work. It's like to give you the blue. hallucinogenic experience. Um, and so you, the people use it for like soul sicknesses or to have a kind of vision of something that could be important for your life. Why don't you just have a martini like this? It doesn't really work in the same way. I don't know. I have this right in front of me. This is very easy. Where, where did you do it, Michelle? In Peru. And do you have to do it with like a shaman or a guide I did, or something? Yeah. Um, there are people now that do it in kind of every country, but in my personal opinion, when you do something like that, I would prefer to have somebody who really knows because you're unlocking a lot of parts of yourself and of your brain and of the world. And if you don't have somebody that can kind of keep you where you're at, you might end up in a good what, psych ward. Were you ward. scared? Is it <laughs> real? Was I mean, that's that's one of the theories about why drug trips end up burning people's brains out is because you don't have somebody to help you process it and make sure it doesn't take you into like a weird space that you can't get out what of. What does the other person do? What does the shaman do? <laughs> that you? shit sucks. I don't know. You know, they were they were that, <laughs> <laughs> they were there doing whatever. It was. I mean, I was a little bit occupied right in my experience but how can another um, person bring you out of a trip that's going on in your own brain uh there were some times when i started to get a little out there and they actually just kind of called my name and were like hey you seem to be and i didn't even know how they could tell because i mean like your eyes are closed how do they know what's happening with me but maybe your heart stops beating or something no 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 I mean, it was a group of us um but there's a lot that goes on in like realms of existence that I don't think we really understand in the West. So I'm sure there were a lot of things that they could perceive that. What I did you couldn't. find out about yourself that you can share? Anything like, um, did you have a major I life change? I probably changing? won't share what I found out about myself. Okay. I did feel a lot more connected to like the earth and life afterwards. It's a very, it, it purges you. So it, it's a lot of throwing up and purging and all. So it's kind of like the martini experience, hasn't yeah. it? Well, <laughs> if you have enough like, bad yeah. rum, it's, it's more <laughs> like, it's more like a hand grenade or a big-ass <laughs> beer. Wow. Yeah. So you, but you enjoyed throwing up. Um, that's not what I said. No. <laughs> have, I don't Thomas, think I, have you I don't done think it? Ever no, I've never taken up. ayahuasca, but... <laughs> You enjoy, enjoy throwing, throwing up. Yeah. I mean, the after the after effect I enjoyed. Right. We distinctly The process was a little difficult. What did you think of cheers the actual? To, cheers to that. What did you think of the actual trip, though? Uh, it was crazy. You know, Does it, come it showed on me certain slowly? things. It, yeah, what? and it showed me certain things that, uh, you know, maybe I didn't know when I was when I was having this experience, like getting rid of things. You know how we, like, maybe what you were talking about, emotional intelligence, and there's like types of trauma that get stuck in your body, right. you know, and there's different ways you can get it out. Like dancing is definitely one of them, and song and those kind of things. And so there were moments where it was like this purging and then like a vision of some type of trauma that had happened. Wow. So. Would you recommend it to these kids that Melissa works with? <laughs> no. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, listen, so you guys are in, in a band as well, together, like as a duo, right? Yeah. As yeah. well as being an interpreter in, in Spanish. And you're a full-time musician, right, Olivia? Yeah, now I am. Since yeah. you've been here, anyway. Yeah, I mean, it takes a little bit of time getting to the circle in New Orleans. But yeah, into the, doing it right into now. the circuit? Yeah. So where are you playing? I see you play at Casa Borrega. Casa Borrega and... Oh, um, where else? Nopsy is a hotel. That yeah, here. right. How did you two meet each other? I think, I remember we talked outside of Hi Ho one night. I think that may have been, when I don't know when we met, but we well, were we outside of... Yeah, Javier, maybe. Oh, yeah, we Javier. met during her... Yeah. Heat. Well, no, I met... We had a friend come on, yeah. I met Olivia outside of Hi Ho one day, and, and 
I like asked her to be on a gig of mine or something, but I didn't even know if she like how she played or anything. But I'd heard so many wonderful things. And then during Hurricane Barry, we both ended up um, sheltering in the same place with but a friend was, of ours. There was no hurricane. There was no, it was Hurricane Barely, yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> and we ended up like just jamming for like 12 hours with some friends in this guy's mm. house. And then it was kind of like, oh, this is interesting. And that's when you yeah. formed this duo, which is called what? Other, yes. What's mm? the name of the duo that you... Sorry? Your call, what's it called? Your group? Uh, duo on Bon. <laughs> we just created his name. You I mean, just made it up? <laughs> yeah. It's got the word I mean, duo. I mean, not jazz now, but and then, yeah, we do it like a Bon Bon. Bon Bon. <laughs> B-O-M-B-O-N. Bon Bon. Yeah, bon. It's, like, it's Bon Bon, but in Spanish. Bon Bon. It's Spanish for bon. But it works for Portuguese also. Yeah. What does it mean in Spanish? It's like a candy. You know oh, how you like, like bon 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 bons? Bon. Yeah, like a chocolate. Ah, okay. But it's kind of general chocolate. candy. Okay. Coco. Yeah. Coco. <laughs> so you guys are called candy. <laughs> Really? Candy duo. Okay, candy. All right. So what about <laughs> what about playing something for us? Yeah. What do you it's think? Good. Yeah, right. we so can definitely just do to that. explain if you listen to this as a podcast and not watching this on video. So mm -hmm. Olivia plays the guitar and Michelle ha is sitting on a drum of some sort. So what do you want to do? What it's called a cajon. Cajon. It means big box. And it's spelled C A J O N. Cajon, that's what that is. Did you know that, Adam? Total. It's a cajon, I didn't know that. Uh, I we, can, with you. we can move this around for you, no worries. Great. Okay, what are you going to play? So, do you want to start with the Brazilian one or whatever? Oh. Eh? Whatever. So, some, something soft or something more like. Um, whatever you, you feel pick. like. Something. You 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 we have, we have many feelings. Adam's going to go. So yeah, let's start with the Brazilian. I was another is is um, okay. Tom Chobin song. It's called Corcovado. It's good. Okay. Do you sing as well, Michelle? Do you sing too? Not Great if we could hear this every yeah, Wednesday, wouldn't it? Sit and to this. I know you could just have them play the whole show. Every time. Actually. Yeah. yeah. We'll just... That's beautiful. It's hard to believe that you can really do that, isn't it, Melissa? Yeah, and you guys have only been playing together like under a couple months. Since uh, Hurricane Barry? Yeah. Or barely. Yeah, it was what, like two months ago? Yeah, but we never S stopped. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, <laughs> it's been non stop every it's moment. You guys have only been playing together forever. 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 That was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, your voice is really, really special. It's like. Thank you. Thank you. How long have you known that you could sing like that since you were a little kid? Oh, I think so. <laughs> I mean, I I think I never practiced singing really. I started like taking like my voice like serious, probably like a, a year ago. But I sing Lief since I have memory probably. You only started taking this seriously a year ago, did you? See, yeah, like one year and two years ago, I started like studying or practicing or trying to know about my voice. Like, what were you doing taking, like, before then? Well, I play, I used to play flute. No, she still plays the flute. Like I'm, she's a monster on the flute. I, I, I play sure flute. I play yeah. flute. Yeah, I play flute now. Also, <laughs> so you're just super talented, basically. 
Well, yeah. I don't know. I don't Apparently. know. I don't know if I can say that in this city. Or well, someone else can say, <laughs> I'll say it. it. I'll yeah. Say it. <laughs> Did you bring your flute with you? Uh, yeah, I do. But it's, it's kind of like weird. Play. I mean, I do have my flute, but I don't know. Somebody wants to play guitar, and so. Adam, well, somebody, we Adam, like you play guitar? We have more I musicians don't. here. I've right? always wanted to. I don't know if there's anyone else here who can play the guitar while you play the flute. We could do a little avant-garde, just flute and percussion. That would be beautiful. Some point, I say you do it. Well, okay, we can maybe do that. That would be interesting. I mean, I don't think anyone's ever played the flute what on we do, show. What we do usually when we play, like, live, a live. 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 <laughs> also, a live. <laughs> I wish you had told me to bring my cello. Uh, do you have a cello? Yeah. Do you play the cello? Not anymore. <laughs> but, but it would be really fun to do it like live on the. Yeah. To like pick Why it up not? for the first time. Had a couple like, of drinks and then. <laughs> yeah. You know. Everything sounds great after. Well, you apparently I love you. I just days. started playing it like take it seriously for two years. Two years ago, so you can <laughs> apparently back it just comes out. Of come back in two years and you can be a professional cello. Well, I, mean, I think your voice is lovely. It's okay, but the percussion. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah. It's awesome. It's fantastic. The whole thing is great. together is great. Yeah. So you were a professional flute player before you decided you could sing? Well, I started singing before I started studying flute, actually. <coughs> but I studied, like, academically. How it, uh, flute. That's correct. Yeah. In, in college. In college, You went to school yeah. for the flute. Yeah. I studied classical music there. Right. And At home in Uruguay before you came? Hmm? The, in Uruguay before in you Uruguay. came to the States? And yes. how did you even get yes. to New Orleans? Well, it was a long travel before New Orleans. <laughs> you were in the States or you were No, uh, well, yeah, I've been around. Uh, I've been in Austin before I came here, like for a few months also. Um, but, yeah, I left my country six years ago, so it's like a long way until this place. It wasn't my plan at all to come here to New Orleans, but one thing takes me to the other, and finally I'm here now, and I'm so happy. You're the one who <laughs> accidentally ended up in New Orleans. I've never met anybody with <laughs> that story. Ever. <laughs> Super rare. Yeah. Are you going to stay, or are you drifting around still? Um, now, yeah, I'm staying here, but I'm not going to stay forever, because it's something that I realized that I can't stop moving. Mm -hmm. I mean, I... That's what you think until you get to New Orleans. I, mean, <laughs> I thought the same thing, and then yeah. I'm still here. Yeah, yeah, you're I'm right, sure you're all right. of us thought that. <laughs> Michelle, uh, Melissa, did you come here forever? I don't know. I kind of came by accident, too. I checked a box what, that got me sitting here. What was here. your story? How did you get Well, I came. I'm Canadian. You didn't even ask me how long I've been here. You asked everyone else. How long have you been here? Give or take 20 years. I came down like 1998 and I left. Um, What's I your actually, immigration status? I'm fine. You're in. I'm in. Okay. Yeah, thanks for asking, though, <laughs> on the air. Right. Um, Olivia, what about you? Do you have a legal immigration issue? Well, yeah, yeah, I do. You're legal? Yes. Okay. We're How'd all you, good at this how table. How did you pull that off? Huh? How did you get legal? Well, I'm in the process right now. Ah, oh, in the process yeah. of getting legal. That's different. Okay. Yeah, but I'm legal. Okay. And how did you get legal? Are you a citizen? I'm an American citizen and a Canadian citizen. Right. Dual citizenship. Dual. Do you, are you going to vote in the Canadian election then? I can't anymore. Oh, why not if you're a citizen? You have to live there? I don't know. I've lived here for 20 years. I vote here. I'm a New Orleanian yeah, and you, I live in Louisiana and I vote you, in... Can you vote in both places though? I actually don't know. I don't believe you can, but I don't know. I could be wrong. I don't know either. I'm pretty sure you can vote in both places. I don't know. I'm pretty not going to sure push you can my... pay taxes in both places, right? If you make no. income in both. <laughs> you do if you make income in both places. And I don't. So you came here uh, for what reason? You didn't come I to New I taught high school. You taught high Years school. ago. Well, I tried to. I wasn't very good. But I tried, and I fell in love with the young people in the community, and then I went back to grad school, and then I started doing statewide juvenile justice reform work, and then started YEP as the uh, first juvenile reentry program in the state of Louisiana in 2004 with two other women. So then after grad school, I've kind of stuck and stayed through Katrina. I came back, and we just kept growing and building. So the, the purpose of what you're doing is to get kids out of the juvenile justice. It was initially, so, but now we're a lot more expansive. So we do a lot more preventative work. We do a lot more enrichment services. We still do mentoring work with kids in the justice system, but we try to do a lot more comprehensive preventative work as so well. So you're trying to do what, what is basically the holy grail in New Orleans, which is to stop people going to jail, to stop crime. Everyone says the biggest problem in New Orleans is crime. Every single person says that. Yeah, even, I think even we, Adam Newman. Right, but we don't pitch, like, what we're really trying to do is to give young people the resources and the skills and the tools and the relationships and the networks they need to thrive and fulfill their potential. So it's really more the positive of that, which is giving all young people the opportunity they need to, to actualize their potential and have the opportunities that we all want for ourselves. So, What does that mean in, in real terms? People get paid more or 
I don't have know. access like, to so resources? I actually think that that's why the Brazilian work's been so interesting is that I think it's actually a lot more intrinsic oftentimes. Like we have great numbers in terms of the number of young people who've gotten their high school equivalency or who moved on to post-secondary education or are making a living wage, but a lot of it starts really inside. Are you happy? Do you feel supported? Do you feel safe? Do you have a community around you? Do you have positive and healthy relationships that make you feel good? So I think that, again, well, a lot of it starts... Can you answer that for yourself? I mean, which of us can say that? No, but I think if are we you all happy? are working... Are you have positive relationships? But it's a work in progress, and a lot of us who have a lot of privilege and have a safety net, a lot of young people don't have that. And so I think really trying to ensure that we're giving young people the tools and the support and the relationships to help them feel loved and supported and cared for is really important. What do you think it is that drives people to take drugs? From an ayahuasca aside... It's a plant, not a drug. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this whole opioid thing is a quest for happiness, isn't it? I don't. I think it's Adam's turn for a question. My God, I don't know. I'm yeah. not an expert. Adam, what do you think? Adam. We don't know anything about opioids. We're sitting at a table think, with three He's really just intelligent. His <laughs> it's intimidating, isn't it? I don't really. <laughs> and, well, four intelligent, and, and I, I just I've learned to not talk <laughs> when I'm in this kind of presence. Uh, really? It's, no. It's Are you able to stay quiet? To listen. It's hard. That's a big lesson. <laughs> anybody listening? Learn. Anybody listening to this would laugh that you just asked that question. But yeah, I have learned to be able to stay quiet. Have it, do you think that's one of the biggest lessons in life to learn is to shut up? <laughs> yeah, I'm learning that really. <laughs> it's I'm kind serious. Of a, it's kind of a recent <laughs> lesson, and I'm, I'm, I have to say, I'm doing pretty well. You've done pretty well so it. far, but now it's all on you. This might be the, the one day. Yeah. <laughs> this is the medium. One thing I do on. know about you is that you're a sponsor of Music Inside Out. I am. I hear I am. your name. You guys listen to that show, Music yeah. Inside yeah. Out? With Gwen Tompkins. Yeah. The, like, my, and then one I of my this, three favorite people in the world. Who are the other two? Oh, I'm not really allowed to say. Gwen Tompkins and two other people are your three favorite people yeah. in the world. Yeah, my son. Oh, my son is one of them. You have a son? I do. And what about Jesus. Oh, he's so cool. Um, uh, yeah, and, and Gwen is going to cringe if she hears so this. So Gwen, because Jesus, and your son, are you? Yeah. Okay. And Kermit the Frog. It's the Holy Trinity. <laughs> Actually, Kermit. Kermit the Frog Gw and my... Gwen Tompkins are in the same pantheon Hell's of yeah. greatness. Actually, um, I can see why you normally stay quiet. <laughs> it'll give uh, Gwen, uh, it'll make her roll her eyes because they always say the name of my studio wrong. What is um, it? It's Adam Newman Studio. It's not Adam Newman Designs. That's what I hear her say. Adam Newman. Design. I know. Over and over and Why? over. Why? Because but, it's the same. But it just tape doesn't matter. All. Yeah, it is. Why don't you but tell the them to fix it if you're paying? Well, are you paying them something? No, I don't pay them anything. I did Why like I ten minutes of work for her three years ago, and she keeps promoting me. Oh, uh, really? Because that's how awesome. Oh, I thought is. that you must be paying them. And you're a sponsor. I was going to hit you up. It's all in. Happy it's all in labor and talent and love. Oh, that's changed our whole. To yeah. mention here, okay, I'll just leave we now. were going to hit you up to sponsor Happy Hour. I thought okay. if you're paying Gwen, yeah. you can totally pay us. Yeah. Okay, so you, what did you do for you? Designed the logo? I did, and uh, some promotional materials for her. We don't have a logo for Happy Hour, really. It's just oh, some well, We're going to make that happen yeah. while can I you, sit here with another martini. Where's my other martini? We this one's a, empty. We can get you another martini. Someone will get you one. Okay. Hey, Jill, can we get Adam another martini so we can get a logo out of it? Okay. <laughs> awesome. All right. <laughs> How would, you, how would you Jill, start drawing us a logo? Another... Oh, yeah. yeah you get another Michelle frosé? needs another frosé. Yeah. Sure. She's looking dry. What kind of martini? What f oh, we need a... Oh, oh, uh, vodka with a twist. Thanks. And a, and a Thank frosé as well. So we're good to go. Okay, awesome. Okay. So what would I start with? Um, yeah, how do you draw a logo? Oh, God, this is so uninteresting. Is it? Um, this is what you do for a living, though, isn't it? Well, like I said. Um, you can't be bored all day, surely, because you're happy, right? I am. I am. I really am. So you can't no, be bored um, all day, I talk about like uh, mostly who your audience is, mostly, and I would kind of think about what appeals to them. Oh, okay. um, I'm not really interested in what would appeal like to you. It would be to them, right? And uh, think about what. Um, what were the who is our audience, and what are they? Have? I don't know. You have to. I mean, I, I am now. That's what. <laughs> right. So you want to like know to hear myself talk? So I'll listening. go home and listen to this. So we have to tell you who. That's how you start off. You want to say who are we appealing to? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's kind of my, okay. my point of view, and then. Um, I, I am actually self-taught about the graphic design. My mom was a graphic designer before they called it a graphic designer. She was a commercial artist. All right. And my degrees are in architecture, but... Um, are you an architect? But I never really practiced. I joke that it's like a, you know, 13-step program to recover <laughs> from architecture. And, you know, that's an architecture joke. Y'all are going to laugh really hard right now. Is it... 
Is that because in architecture people avoid the 13, like the 13th floor? And oh, all that oh kind I haven't of thought about that. No. 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 So what Maybe. is it? I don't know. Why is it? No, there's just like a secret step that only we understand because we're like really full of ourselves. Architects are super full of themselves. They think they can do everything. And a lot of them can. But um, I never, I never practiced. I, I What's the secret married an architect. Yeah. You did, um, and she didn't really enjoy the practice. And she's a few years my senior, and she looked at me and she's like, ah. So we started a business together, and doing branding and graphic design um, a lot of years ago. Right. And, and we had worked a son. together for years. We had a son. And how we old is he exactly? He's 22. Oh wow. Yeah. He's um, in media arts and uh, music production, and uh, he does what a lot of these guys do that I'm looking at right now. He's very talented. He's a composer, um, and he's six foot three. Like Asher. Well, is he in New Orleans? No, he's not. He's in Denver. He just finished University of Denver, and um, he's still there for a little while. Right. And uh, he's super skilled, creative. He's kind of a creative hummingbird who does a little bit of everything. Why did you go to architecture school? If you didn't really want to do it, because it seems like it's hard work. You know, well, it is. Um, I didn't start at Tulane in architecture, but I met really interesting people. And so after a year, I went into architecture. And I think um, a lot of people go to architecture school and don't practice, because what it is is it's a great education that helps you see the world, see things that other people don't see. Um, what can you see right now that we can't see? Like other dimensions? Ghosts. Other dimensions, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, just how people use spaces and how people use things and um, maybe things that they're not even... Has it worn off after all these years or do you still see things other people don't see? I still, I still see it. You and still... in New Orleans, it's really easy because it's just everywhere. Particularly in New Orleans where hmm. the old meets the new. You know, I think people are... Um, uh, we don't do the new very well. We kind of try to fake the old. And uh, that's sometimes frustrating. I think it's the most interesting when the new meet the old meets the old in a really. Um, how did you go from? Way. But how did you go from architecture to branding? I know it's only A to B, but still. Well, graphic design. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, branding seems like a sort of a, kind of a bullshit. Well, again, thing. it's like well, yeah. I mean, Whereas architecture is be. real. Mm. I don't mean bullshit in a bad way. No, you know, I, mean, I mean in like in it a sort of. It certainly can be. It certainly, certainly can be. But I think the idea is, um, it's a word that's kind of gotten kind of bantered around a lot in the last five, six, ten years. But I think that it has a lot to do with um, this notion that people. Well, I, I teach at Loyola, and I talk about this, and and I say, you know, people are like, oh, I want to, I want you to create a brand, and I said, well, I can, I can sort of foster your brand, but I don't really get to make it. Um, you don't decide what your brand is. Everybody around you. That's what you're saying. So your audience, or the yeah, your the audience market. decides what it right. is, and it, and it can change. I mean, you know, Bill Cosby had a brand, and that changed. Um, well, he changed it. Well, well with our perception, he, of had, him. he had done what he did a long time ago, and then and then the brand changed. Right. Uh, you know, Subaru didn't walk out to be. Uh, you know, Subaru. Uh, How's that? There's, well. Um, I, I just think a lot of companies don't. I mean, the, the you know the classic is Walmart and Target are the same thing, but somehow they feel like very different things. But it's the same thing. It's a big box that sells right all kinds of crap. Yeah, but you can say that about anything is the same thing. I mean, this is the a, a room with chairs in it, and so was so was my living room. Sure, but they're not sure. the same thing. No, because one so is tons of fun for lots of people and really talented women who sit around a table who are. Who should be talking instead? And the other one right is now. Wayfair. And then the other one is Wayfair. Right. Okay. So you teach at Will is what came out I of do. the whole thing. And that's been super interesting. <laughs> that must be. So you gave up the old Adam Newman studio? Studio. No, I still I still do it. Although I keep threatening to kind of retire from it, but um, I do I do teach. You do. And, uh, okay. Can we go to your class? Can we like? Oh, I'd love it. Can you audit your class. I'd love it if you would audit yeah. my class. Can we okay. get a brand out I've, of it? Can I've we been, get a logo? Oh, totally. Hey, um, listen, we're going to take a quick break here for one second. When we come back, we're going to talk about the... Because you're both in the justice system, you two, in different ways. In very different ways. In very different ways. Let's talk about the New Orleans justice system in just a moment when we come right back on Happy Hour. And we're back on Happy Hour with Adam Newman, Michelle Welshans, <laughs> Olivia Lee, and Melissa Sawyer. If only every commercial break could be just that fast. Isn't it perfect? You know, it's I know. This is exactly yeah. It was the greatest commercial break of all time. I was going to say, I said before the break that we we're going to come back and talk about the New Orleans <laughs> justice system because you're a translator in the court system, yeah, Michelle, right? Yeah, I'm a court interpreter. 
Interpreter it's, for whom? For people who get arrested? It's true that I'm an interpreter. So <clears throat> I've done translating, which is documents, and I do transcribing, which is audio files. And I've done that for 13 years. And I do a lot of like police tapes of interrogations or mostly interrogations, or, like witness statements and things like that. So when I became a court interpreter, which interpreting is in person, translating, right? I decided to not go to the criminal courts because it's just so dark and heavy and I listened to it for so many years and something strange about being an interpreter is, or translator is I think it's kind of like being a journalist where you're in these like very weird situations or heavy situations and you're taking a, like they, they take a picture right and I help with communication but I can't help the situation so it can be very frustrating to be like in a criminal setting like that like and feel totally helpless so I just do um, like depositions in lawyers' offices, and I do workers' compensation stuff. But I've avoided criminal court so far because it's depressing. Yeah. Basically, because you're watching Basically. those terrible things happen to people, and you wish you could intervene. Right. And have you an thought about becoming a lawyer? I oh yeah, of course I've thought about it. <laughs> that would help. I think we all think about it sometimes. It's a long it's a long road, and uh, I'm actually kind of turned more towards uh, music as opposed to getting another type of career that's cerebral. Well, law is one of those degrees, again, like architecture, I compare them because you don't have to practice law when you're done. And it's just another one of those that helps you see things that maybe, other, you know, you see the world in a way that you wouldn't have. Well, if you listen to enough police tapes. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> but, but, Melissa, this is kind of how you got started by witnessing people in a bad situation and wanting to do something, being frustrated that these people were in a bad state and you could actually help them. Yeah, and I just like, I want to thank you for doing that. Because I think one of the things we see is also like, it's the quality of the translation that makes such a difference. And oftentimes, if you don't have good translators, you are the voice, you are that lifeline for people who otherwise will not be understood or will be misunderstood or understood incorrectly. And so I think, again, the value of compassionate, really talented translation is so important, especially for people who are terrified or who feel underserved or, you know, are dealing with other things. So that's, that's really awesome. And just thank you for doing that. Because I know, I know we see in like, depending on translation that we've had in some of our travel even, the tone is just different and how people are embraced and how people feel and the energy in a room is really different. And I think putting people at ease and them knowing in their heart that you are actually, you have their best interests at heart and that you are truly factually transmitting, you know, their words and their language and their experience is really important. What do you see mostly? What kind of a person who can't speak English is arrested here? Well, the people that here in New Orleans, yeah. um, the people that I mostly interpret for, like I said, is workers' comp stuff. So it's usually, you know, like construction workers or um, service industry people, housekeeping, that kind of thing. And it's, you know, people have been injured on the job, and for whatever reason they end up in court, you know, usually the, whatever reason would be that the company doesn't want to pay them. Okay. Um, so me personally, you know, I see people who have all types of different kind of, I guess, status. And so then the companies try to take advantage of that. And they might, you know, there's a lot of injustice in that regard because you're supposed to get workers' comp no matter what, you know. But um, if there's no record of you ever having worked for my company, then I can just say you didn't. Right. And then you might be out of work for the rest of your life because, you know, your fingers got cut off or something. So Have you seen that happen? Um, I've... People's fingers get cut people off. With or people, no fingers I've court. seen people people who have lost uh, an important part of their movement. You know, like maybe their elbow got totally decimated, and so now they can't bend their arm. And these are people who only know manual labor, and maybe they're 50 years old, 60 years old. And workers' comp, they're kind of little out. Is that you can get a desk job that would pay the same as your construction job. Therefore, we don't need to pay you any money. But most of these people, you know, grew up somewhere in the middle of nowhere in Central America, they don't know how to read or write, they can't do a desk job, you know, <laughs> so right. they have no desk job skills, and so it's, you know, even though it's not like the justice system as far as like criminal stuff, there's a lot of lack of justice that you can still see in that regard. Right. What do you think it was, Melissa, that made you made the leap from being a witness to this to actually wanting to step in and help? 
and I guess I wasn't like a witness per se. Like I was a witness to seeing young people who were locked up for many, many years and taken away from their families and communities and weren't given educational skills or mental health services or employment readiness skills. And it just felt like this was a, a moral injustice and that, you know, our children deserve better and, and no child deserves to be held in those conditions. Um, but it was really losing a number of young men to gun violence um, in the last sort of phase of our juvenile justice work that it just, it became sort of a decision I had to make for me, like mentally, emotionally, do I want to keep trying to help kids come home from jail if they're not safe in their own communities and we as a community aren't really embracing them and giving them the supports and the love and the support and the help and the skills they need. And so it, it just really became, if I'm going to stick and stay here in New Orleans and do this work, then we need to try to create a program that's going to be really targeted and developed with these young people in mind to try to do something to help them because they and deserve it. And it's working. Yeah. We're, you know, every, yeah, it's a work in progress, but we've made a, a big impact. We're 15 years old this year. So we started the year before Katrina and um, we have an awesome staff of over 50 folks and working with There's over 50 folks. people. Don't you think you should be a household name in New Orleans? Well, we're they kind household. Of are. are they? In some household screen. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I you know. should be like part of the part of the city organization. You should be part of the. We you partner know. with the city and the state, and we have a lot of strong community partners. We have um, an awesome, like actually, youth-led design studio, Design Works. I don't mm -hmm. know if you know Ashley and Bernie on our team are amazing mm -hmm. and Jihad, and that could be a cool opportunity to bring some of our young people to your class. Like I think, Let's again, yeah, there's a lot of. You have a design studio. Our, our young as people. Part design of Works is one of our employment readiness training, so it's a creative digital media um, employment track where the young people are gaining skills, building their portfolios, doing real So it's an work. actual job. I mean, it's an actual design studio. People br you bring... Yeah, it's a, they're, they're apprentices, so they're learning, but the young people go through phase one, which is six weeks, and then they're with us for six months, where they're actually learning from professionals like Adam and doing real-world projects. They redesigned our logo, logo and our business cards and have done a lot of work for us, but also work with external community partners, too. So that's... Well, that's pretty interesting. How yeah, did you come just, up with that one? Um... It just sort of happened. There was a woman who was doing some contracting work with us named Alberta, and she was awesome and actually started off as um, YCA, and then we brought them in, and then it became Yep Design Works. And um, last year, the mayor's office brought our young people in to design the logo for the Office of Youth and Families. So it was actually like young people who were driving that, which was cool. So again, the young people are awesome and so creative. Um, we were Cam Jordan's um, My Cleats My Cause last year, so our young people actually designed his cleats for the game, and they learned how to do that. So we have, you know, we've done some great stuff with the NBA and um, with the NBA Players Association, done a lot of stuff with local nonprofits supporting them. So we're talking to nonprofit. Who's funding you? Is it independent people? Yeah, you know, we. So our budget's pretty. Good. We get funding from all sorts of folks: individuals, corporations, foundations, um, you know, governmental entities. So we kind of try to keep a pretty diverse funding stream. Just recognizing. Is, it, is that mostly what you do? Uh, the, the um, yeah, that's a big of part it? of my job. Again, yeah. just trying to make sure people know this is really important, and, and I think yet yeah, makes all of us you know, happier and healthier and stronger as a community and that it's important that we all care about our young people and invest in them. All right. I think we'd all agree with that, wouldn't we? Yes. Absolutely. Olivia, are you still I'm with us? I'm trying to follow. <laughs> how, how is it trying to follow conversations like this when it's a second language? Uh, Do you get tired? Well, sometimes I get lost. If it's too fast, sometimes I can't. But... Uh, sometimes the, the harder part for me is like get focused, really. Focused. Focused. Yeah. Stay I thought focused. you said I thought you said fuck you actually. <laughs> I honestly did Sublim you think she said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Freudian. Yeah. yeah. So if you drift away for a minute. Let's just know that's what she's thinking. Yeah. Are you thinking about something else? What are you thinking about instead of juvenile justice? No, tr trying to be focused. <laughs> <laughs> Did you did, did you follow did you follow any of that? It's just getting it's just getting. I can totally have, have Michelle translate that for you. Oh yeah yeah yeah. yeah. Can you give her a quick? Can you catch her up? Catch her up in the little. That little, little. said, I'll catch her up on the next break. All right. Okay. Well, the next break is going to be you guys playing a song. What are you going to oh, play great. next? All right, we're going to do this song. It's um, it's called Caravan, but we are going to play in. In the rhythm is like an Afro Uruguay rhythm. It's called Candombe. 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 We have in, in Montevideo actually we have a kind of the same story as New Orleans with slaves from Africa are arrived and they create this music. It's called Candombe. It's like a drum, a huge movement that happens in my country like the second night here every Sunday. 
Oh, is that right? Yeah, the and Uruguay, we have the... Huh? There's a Uruguayan version of second line. Yeah, it's Kandombe. different, but yeah, it's not... Hor- they're not horns, but it's only drums. Three different types of drums, and it's like 60 drums in walking on the, on the street. But like a where. samba kind of? It's like a... Well, maybe same roots, but different, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, Africa, is samba African? No. It's from Brazil. Samba's Brazilian, but, but was it originally African? Yeah, it's, it's African roots for sure. Yeah. Candomba. So this is a candomba. Did you know the surf, Michelle, before you met all of you? <clears throat> well, candomba specifically, no. <clears throat> I lived in South America for like six years, um, and I took it upon myself to do a lot of research on where like different, especially Cuban music, which is not in South America, but where Cuban music came from and like she said it's like a very similar story in a lot of countries of enslaved Africans coming and mixing of cultures and then you get these drum new new drum rhythms that are kind of like a fusion of traditions from different African cultures why did uh, why did all these people go to Africa to steal other human beings do you think I what don't the hell is that all about? I mean that's not within my realm of understanding you never got that to that in research I mean, you know, there's like trade routes and all of that kind of thing, but I don't know really what occurs to why it occurs to any human to go steal right. another human and force him to work. And le- but all about these him. disparate countries apparently went to Africa. To well, it's just st- Spain, st- Portugal, and England, really. In the United and States, France. I guess. In well, the, France? I mean, in the United States, that was England at that point in time. Okay. That was stealing. Was it the British people. that had slaves? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's the British that brought people here. And then Spanish that brought people to South America, and the Portuguese that brought people to like Brazil and the but French. But all these places are individual countries; they're not related to each other necessarily. Well, geographically, they're related, right? It's all the I'm well, just talking about like the Americas. The and then from Africa, you're talking about mostly West Africa, but it could also be other types of cultures that were, because there were people that were captured inside of Africa and then brought to the coast. So you really, it's kind of there's a representation from a lot of different parts of Africa and in southern South America like Brazil a lot of those people came more like from southern West Africa which like Angola and Brazil have a huge connection if you look on the map they're basically the same latitude okay we we went to the Afro-Brazilian Museum when we were in Sao Paulo and I think one of the things that was just so compelling was just like the similarities between you know and our young people again and staff and all of us were so moved by just looking at the comparison just how terribly and horrific people were treated in Brazil again and it's not it wasn't just an American reality and I think again it was really powerful just for us to see that in the South American context too don't you think it's weird that we have this giant World War II museum here but we don't have a slavery museum well, I haven't been to the m- amazing one in Birmingham, but I've heard it's phenomenal um, that EJI has put out. And so, again, I think that there's one in the South now that has been a long time coming, but it's really, really important. That there was a movement for a while um, to, rather than necessarily uh, create a building that's a New Orleans Museum on Slavery, to, to create on-site uh, installations to say that, that are almost more real world to say, Right here, where you're standing, this is what happened. Um, like, and 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 the like challenging the- thing is, people don't, or the city thinks that people don't want to, while they're drinking and having a good time, be reminded that you know two siblings were sold and never saw each other again. You know, at this spot where you stood, or no, this person was sold to be bred. There's actually, um, oh, I'm sorry. You know, right in right while you're where you're right. having a. a I'm not here. Yeah. Right. 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 There's actually, there is, um, there are two things that I think are worth mentioning for New Orleans in this regard. There's the Backstreet Cultural Museum, which is in the Treme, and that's really centered around like Mardi Gras Indian culture. And then there's this other company called Hidden Histories, and they do walking tours of um, the French Quarter. And actually, you can, they, part of the tour can also be on a bus, and they take you like to the Ninth Ward and stuff. And they actually tell you the story of New Orleans from the black perspective. And so they tell you those things. Like when you go to Jackson Square, they're like, they tell you the other side of the story, the things that you didn't know about the slave trade and about how it worked and about this side of the Mississippi and that side of the Mississippi and all that stuff. So I think, I mean, I know mm-hmm. those things actually do exist in New Orleans, but, but it's, it's just a it's little bit... But it's temporal because um, yeah, it's not like a you, building you, you say it to. and then you go away and it vaporizes, right? And so I've, I've actually been interested in talking to uh, property owners uh, in the quarter and other parts of the city about, about allowing... Um, installations to occur that, that are physical, that are there you know, all the time and that you can't not look at right. everybody sees. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and actually, Grant, that's where architecture and graphic design uh, come Neat. together as a, um, 
what we call environmental graphics. Which, so what would it look like? Which is something like? that I specialize in. Okay, um, environmental graphics. Which sounds like you print on recycled paper, but it really <laughs> just means it look like in the environment. In the environment. So well, this would look like a plaque on a building like you see I on mean, a historical I mean, it could be a, something as sort of banal as that, and that could be... You know, but that's pretty. Fine. That's pretty lame. Maybe what are you talking something about? That, you about something more maybe there's something that's more engaging. Like what? Um, like what? I don't know. I haven't. I haven't even begun to think about what ah. the physicality of it would be. And and of course, you know, you don't want it to uh, overwhelm the physical, you know, environment. The, the 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 French Quarter is its own, you know, museum architecturally, but um, but it should probably be just jarring enough just a little bit jarring to make you understand how jarring the phenomenon is and, the, and that history is. So that would be, um, that's actually something that I've, I've kind of just started to talk about, how to um, get people together to, to agree on, on uh, something like that. That's, that's something I haven't really talked about very much to, to people. So here it is on the, on the air. Um, it's an and, and I idea. know very little about the subject matter, and it would just be that my my take on it would just be how to manifest it and how to make it and how people would perceive these as objects um, and as language and, and the writing but I would need to work with people who Michelle could help are you historians and, 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 and I'm culturalists. I'm definitely not a his, no, Hidden Histories is a New Orleans That's company. I'm not, I'm not the one. Have but have I could put you in touch that? with them. I don't know people. about them so yeah. that would be fantastic. Yeah, I've never heard of them either. Melissa, you've never heard of Hidden Histories either. That's a very interesting idea. It's but the great. city's not going to do it. You know the city is afraid of it. So um, well, they took down the yeah the statues. Yeah. So I guess if they wouldn't mind, which I understand. I, I personally, I'm kind of sometimes sad that it wasn't an opportunity for where there's a piece of art that's from a culture that we, you know, abhor. Right. I, I, my take is I wish that there could be another piece of art. And this happens in right. Germany where there's another piece of art that that um, confronts that first piece of art that basically is a, ah. you know. So fuck, that just basically says fuck you, um, Focus. And, and and then yeah, this other you know to to look at Lee and 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 uh, and respond to that rather than mm. taking Lee away to respond to Lee and just well that was not an argument that was work. that surfaced during the whole well debate it's a hard it. it's a hard argument and I understand actually it was that but I it just was it was Tom unpopular yeah I followed that beat for WWNO for a while right and it was and that actually was one. Uh, pushed by. Professors at Tulane. Yeah, yeah. It, it kind of gets seen as a highbrow, yeah, yeah, sure, whatever kind of thing. But <laughs> it happens all over Germany, um, and and it, it's so a really powerful the, they way. They keep the Nazi past or the sort of, of anti-Semitic past. A lot like. of it is there, and then you create wow. another piece of art that is in hmm. response to that, so that there's a so that there's a dialogue instead of it just vaporizing. But, but then but, why but wouldn't but that work so the other way? Then if someone, if you just got your way and you put up a piece of art that commemorated. The terrible thing that happened in this space. Why wouldn't someone then say, "Well, we need to have a balancing"? Yeah, I think that that's totally well. They can. Um, I think that's one of the great opportunities for art and design is to create a uh, to create dialogue and to make people aware of things in the environment. And this hmm. goes back to architecture school: is to you know seeing things that other people don't see, opportunities that people don't see. Um, that a, that a whole uh, cultural dialogue can exist out of the built environment. So it's not just a, a building in the sense that it's just sheltering water hmm. uh, and weather. That's a pretty interesting idea, don't you think? Yeah? She's trying to follow me. I don't know that I can follow her. <laughs> okay, so back she's to, to... She's trying to focus. Back to <laughs> duo bon bon. Bon bon. I want to hear more music. Yes, we're going to hear a song called Caravan. Yeah, I mean, Caravan, is, you probably already know this song, right? It's like super... In the can. Is it uh, Dizzy Gillespie? Did Santana do it? Dizzy Gillespie. Did ah. It. <laughs> it's pretty common here in New Orleans. It's a, Oops. It's a song you can hear a lot of times, but like Olivia said, we're doing a little different kind okay. of way. No flute in the song. Unfortunately. Fading light, the 
chains up on a concrete tree. Up on my shoulder as we creep across the sands of Amity. This memory of our character. Seriously great. great, isn't it? Awesome. That's shocking how good that is. Thank you. <laughs> really? I mean, seriously, isn't it? Michelle, how did you become a percussionist? Hi. What did that? <clears throat> so, grew up playing, uh, grew up playing music in different capacities, and then I took a little long break when I was traveling around um, the world. And then I started playing, actually, well, I started doing West African dance, and then I hurt my foot. And um, the class was like my favorite thing in my life. So I just went and asked if I could play the drums. And they said yes. And then I decided that was way better than dancing. I still love dancing. Um, Did you hurt your foot dancing? I hurt my foot dancing salsa. Somebody stepped on it with uh, their high heels. Oh. <laughs> so just kinda, I yeah, I mean, but I couldn't. Stop. It was just like two weeks that I couldn't really walk very well. Um, yeah, but that makes a good story. It's a great story. And yes, and then after that, I just kind of decided to follow the drums. And, and uh, here we are. Wow. Yeah. Okay, talking about here we are, we have to get out of here, yeah, actually. Yeah, there we were. We've only got a few minutes to go. So let me just say before we go that Happy Hour today has been brought to us by the Positive Vibrations Foundation, who create and encourage community through the development and preservation of the arts, music, culture, and heritage. And also by Basics on Magazine Street near Jefferson Avenue. Basics underneath sells fine lingerie. And Basics Swim and Gym has a full range of fashion swimsuits, workout, and yoga clothes with style. And also the Adam Newman Studio. Is that right? Wow. Nice, thank you. That's <laughs> I got that right in there. Designed. Not yet. And if we get That's our logo, perfect. then we can start yeah, saying that. Right. If you'd like Come to on. be a member of our Patreon family, you can go to patreon.com and search for It's New Orleans Happy Hour. And you too can be a member of our Patreon family for just as little as one single dollar and get access to all sorts of other stuff besides the show. And if you go to our website, it's now called itsneworleans.com or inobroadcasting.com. It's brand new as of this hour, right now. Whoa. It's a brand new website. I know, pretty exciting, isn't it? So go check that out. Okay, look, before we wrap up here, we've got to find out, where do we hear you guys playing Do a Bon Bon? So we'll be playing, uh, we play different places, but we'll be playing this Saturday, actually, at Casa Borrega from 7 to 10, the two of us. And then I actually have a show next Wednesday at Ace Hotel at 9 p.m. It's my original music, my original band, and Olivia's uh, part of my band, so she'll be playing flute and singing on that show, too. What's your band called? My band is called Orchidia, like Orchid. Orchid Orchidia. with an EA at yeah. the end. Yeah, and it's three horns with a rhythm section and percussion, some of the best musicians in New Orleans, and it's all oh, original I'm glad you managed to music. mention that in the last 30 seconds yeah. of the show. Thank so it'll be at Three Keys, Ace Hotel, 9 p.m. on Wednesday, October 16th. <laughs> okay. And we can, we'll put a, we can put a link to all this stuff on our website, it's neworleans.com, if you go to the happy Great. hour yeah, section of our site. Yeah, we have a little site. Instagram on there. Okay, you're on Instagram too. We can link to all that sort of oh, stuff on our site. And, and we can find you at Casa Borrega. We can yeah, easily yeah. find you there. Yeah, yeah. 
And the Youth Empowerment Project, YEP. It's right across the street, too, from Casa Borrego. So oh, next time y'all are down there, not on the set. Well, so no, Ashe, we're on the 1600 block. Um, on, yeah, on uh -huh. Aretha Castle Haley, and then that's on the 1700 block. But I'm serious about maybe getting y'all to come and do some music with the young yeah, people, yeah, and then that. do yeah. some translation. Yeah. So we'll figure out Absolutely. how to make that happen. Totally. And some of the circling, because we always start with music, but it would be awesome to have y'all come yeah, and play totally and awesome. yeah. yeah, workshops. Yeah, that'd be amazing. Okay, Melissa Sawyer, thank you so thank much you. for it's being nice here. To be here. It's, it's been pleasure great. I've been trying to get you on the show for ages, so I'm glad you finally made it. Olivia Lee. Michelle Welshon and Adam Newman, thank you so much for joining us, everybody. Thank you, That's Grant. been, you're welcome. That's been Happy Hour for another week. The producer of our show is Graham DePonte. Our music producer is Monique Pyle, and our music consultant is Christian Unruh. Thomas Walsh is our technical director, and our Facebook Live feed director, who put this whole thing on Facebook Live, is Asher Griffith. Our fact checker and social media connector is Andrew Sirock. Sirock, our theme music was written by and is currently being played by Mitch Foreman. If you'd like to be on our show and you can stay upright for about an hour while drinking alcohol, drop us a line. Our address is on our website, the brand new itsneworleans.com. You can also check out other happy hours on that space as well as shows we make here, including Out to Lunch with Peter Raschuti, live from Commander's Palace, Louisiana Eats with Poppy Tooker, and our award-winning podcast about death called Death the Podcast. You can also find other great Louisiana podcasts at itsacadiana.com and itsbatonrouge.la. You can keep up with us on a bunch of time-sucking social media like Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. On all of it, we're called It's New Orleans, and you can find photos from this show on itsneworleans.com and on our It's New Orleans Happy Hour Facebook page. These photos are taken today by Jill Lafleur, and you can find more of Jill's photos at lafleurphoto.com. If you listen to this on your favorite podcast app, thank you for subscribing to us. If your podcast app has a share option, try telling a couple of friends about Happy Hour. The show is recorded live today at Wayfair on Ferret Street in Uptown New Orleans. Happy Hour is a production line and broadcasting for itsneworleans.com. If you're looking for Andrew Duhon, go to andrewduhon.com. He's still out on the road. He should be back here, I think, next week. If he's not, you can see him in a town near you somewhere around the country. Thank you on behalf of Andrew, who's not here, who will be here, and everybody else around the table at Wayfair, and back at Alpha Slano Broadcasting. Thanks for joining us. I'm Grant Morris. We'll see you back here next week for more Happy Hour. <laughs>